If you uh, didn't take notice while Hannah was speaking, no matter where you go, you can't take the Texas out of that girl. <laughs> that word y'all was used numerous times. <laughs> so we understood you very well. That's a, we're your people, in case you were wondering. So absolutely. What a, what a blessing. Uh, someone just at, told me a while ago that you're going to have to cut it short or we're going to be here all day. Um, I get that. Uh, I was already planning for that. Okay. So Deacon, Robert, I just want you to know that I'm going to cut it short. Okay. I wasn't going to call you out, but I noticed you were already napping back there during the song service. So I'm not really sure what you were complaining about. Um, it is, it's awesome to get to watch some of these young ladies who my wife has got to walk with in their journey and to see the impact that they have for the kingdom. And so I'm so thankful for all that uh, we get to watch. Um, uh, we've known Hannah since she was a little bitty. And uh, we've got to watch her grow up. And, and I think that Doug and Marcy are, are the same. They've known her. And, uh, and so it's just a real blessing to watch someone that God has taken and just shaped into a vessel that he can use. And that's really what it's about for all of us to be shaped. Um, so what Satan does is he keeps us so busy that we don't have time to be shaped. We're going in 24 million different directions. And that's why the Bible tells us to be still and to know. And uh, you can't get to know him if you're not still long enough to sit in the presence and just to sit there and, and, and to literally just take that time to get to know who God is. And part of that is through scripture, part of that is through prayer, but all of it comes through faith. And so we are so thankful. This morning we're going to look at abiding in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now that was too much really to go up, but I can see it, a little bitty right underneath the word abide, that, that whole sentence is there. Um, but um, if you're wanting to put a the actual title, it is Abiding in the Death, Burial, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see before us the Lord's Supper. Um, and so what I want us to do this morning is touch on the, why we really celebrate the Lord's Supper. What is the purpose and what really represents the Lord's Supper? So if you have your Bible, turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to be reading from verses 8 through 15. And we would ask that you stand in honor of God's word. See to it that there is no one who takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception in accordance with human tradition, in accordance with the elementary principles of the world, rather than in accordance with Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete and he is the head over every ruler and authority. So those of you who are complaining, includes me, about what's happening in our nation's capital, God already knows about it, and he's above all that. That's what we have to trust in. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision performed without hands. We're talking here of the heart, people, and the removal of the body of the flesh by circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, when we see baptism, what do we say? Buried in the likeness of Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. We are giving that picture of recognizing the death of Christ and we then ourselves die to ourselves. In which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our wrongdoings. Can somebody say amen? amen. Having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. 
Father, this morning we pray that we can understand what really was happening in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Give us that wisdom and understanding this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We read here in this particular passage all the things that were happening when this letter was being written. It was being written for a reason. People had snuck into the church stating that Christ had not actually risen. Um, there was a lot of stuff happening. Uh, and so the, Paul here is writing this letter to let them know, listen, your whole hope <laughs> is based upon the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And, and he is saying here that for us, we symbolize our death with Christ in our baptism. And he also says that when we were dead in our wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of our flesh, he made us alive together with him, having forgiven us all our wrongdoings. So think about this. How many of us in this room, if we have a particular person that we don't care for, in our minds, we have a list of wrongdoings they have done, okay? Y'all can say amen because you know it's true, right? We know it's true. If there's somebody that we don't care for, we have a list that we have written down in our mind. It is, been, matter of fact, we've chiseled it in stone in our brains how we feel, and we justify it by all that they've done against us. The Bible says that Jesus had that list and said, I'm done with it. Folks, do you realize what all we have done against the cross, against our Savior, that he could have written down everything, chiseled it in stone, and said, you are unforgivable. But that's not what he said. He said, because you're unforgivable, let me pay the price. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? And he did all of this, according to Colossians 2.15, the cross of Christ won us the victory that we could never have won for ourselves. Listen to what he says. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphant, triumphed over them through him, him being Christ. God took his son and put him on a sinner's cross. You realize that that cross was for people who were guilty. They were guilty. They were found guilty. They were found to be uh, guilty of a particular crime, and therefore they would be put upon the cross. Christ took the cross of Barabbas. You know who Barabbas represents? All of us in this room. Every single one of us in this room, Christ took your cross. Isaiah 53, on the cross, God piled all our sins on Jesus, and he bore the punishment due us. Listen to what Isaiah says here. Isaiah 53, however, it was our sickness that he himself bore and our pains that he carried, yet we ourselves assumed that he had been afflicted, struck down by God and humiliated. In other words, we thought, well, he must be guilty. Look what happened. No, no, no. Definitely not guilty. But he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. You said earlier that you liked it when your plans worked, right? But what if our plans aren't what God had planned? That's why we go astray because we don't, well, God, I, I get what you want, but this is what I want instead. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. Folks, let me tell you something. You can never, ever, ever be punished enough for your wrongdoing to be accepted into heaven. A lot of us, well, God, if you'll just take it out, just go ahead and punish me. I know I deserve it. God says, yeah, you deserve it, but I'm not going to give it to you. I'm giving it to my child, my son. How many of you would be willing to take your child 
and take all the punishment of the world and place it upon your child. God was willing to do that. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open what? His mouth. Y'all know what we'd be doing, right? If we were falsely accused and we were being crucified for no reason, we would be screaming and hollering. But yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that's silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. In other words, folks, he trusted God. He trusted the one who put him there. <clears throat> by, oppo- by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who was considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the wrongdoing of my people to whom the blow was due. We know who was guilty, but Jesus came and took the guilt. In his death, Jesus took upon himself the curse introduced by Adam. What was Adam's sin? And don't say he bit an apple because I will throw something at you. <laughs> what was his disobedience, right? It was disobedience. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Do y'all understand that this death made Jesus look guilty? That's because for a moment in time, he took our guilt. The innocent one took our guilt. The innocent one took our punishment. The innocent one took our pain. And yet we treat Jesus... And we treat our Christianity as though it's a point of convenience. Whenever I desire to follow God, well, I'll follow God. When I feel like going to church, well, I'll go to church. When I feel like reading my Bible, well, I'll read my Bible. Folks, do you think Jesus did all of this so that we could just kind of, whenever we wanted to, follow him? Christ did this so that every single day we would surrender our lives to him. A lot of us think that the moment of surrender is the moment of salvation. No, folks, the moment of surrender is every single moment of your life. It started the day that you gave your life to him, not through some prayer. Okay, a lot of people say, well, I prayed this prayer. No, folks, the Bible does not say that you pray a prayer to receive Christ. The Bible says we believe. We believe. So his death was necessary because you and I could not die or be punished enough for our salvation. His death was necessary. It was mandatory from the Father. So we see his death, and next we see the significance of his burial. Some of my favorite scriptures right here in Matthew 27, verses 59 through 61, it says, And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, And laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb, and he went away. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. Now, why do they have all these people mentioned? Because you got to have witnesses to prove something. These people would have known who these folks were, and they would have known them to be trustworthy. They would have known them to be true. And they would have said, yes, if they were there, then this happened. We have this, but my favorite part, y'all all all know it. What kind of tomb was Jesus buried in? A borrowed tomb. I love that. I love that. Why? He only needed it for two and a half days. I mean, think about this for a moment. Here he is. He's he's on the cross. Why couldn't he like die on the cross and suddenly come alive again? I'll tell you why. Because folks, to be dead and to be buried was more powerful. Powerful not just in the way that he was resurrected, folks, but powerful in the fact that he was willing to go to the tomb itself and overcome the grave. How could he overcome the grave if he didn't get in it? He goes to the 
tomb. They, they roll the stone. It's amazing to me when we think about this beautiful scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4 tells us this. For I handed down to you as of at first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Folks, we have a Savior who went to the cross, overcame the cross. He said, but he died. Folks, trust me when I tell you he overcame death. He overcame the punishment. He overcame the cross for us. Then he went to the tomb. They buried him. They put him inside. They rolled the stone over. And he spent two days in the belly of this tomb. But on the third day, what happened? Y'all remember what Michael Satterfield used to say? He got up. So what he said, he, he didn't lay there forever. He got up on that third day. And so we need to see, folks, the importance of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19 says, Now if Christ has preached that he, was, that he has been raised from the dead, how do some, you, some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is what? In vain. I'm telling you here this morning, folks, if if you put your hope in Jesus for anything other than his resurrection, folks, if he did not rise from the dead, our faith is dead. It's pointless. And if Christ has not been raised and our preaching is in vain, your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise. In fact, the dead are not raised. Or if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Boy, that's a scary thought, isn't it? You know, that would mean that everybody in this room who claims to be a Christian is still guilty. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if we have hoped in Christ only in this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. Folks, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, everything that we say we believe in is pointless. Brother Tom, what does this mean for us? We get, he died to take our place. He went to the cross to take our cross. He was put in the tomb to overcome it. He was resurrected. So what about us? If you ever go to a funeral that I preach, and if, if that funeral is of a believer, you will always hear this passage of Scripture In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, many of you know this particular scripture. And to me, it's it's my hope. When I go to a graveside and and we're about to bury someone, or if I'm in memorial service with someone uh, who is a believer, I want to share this with people because it doesn't matter if their body's been buried or their body's been burned or their body's been lost at sea. My God is able. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 says, But we do not want you to be ignorant or uninformed, brothers, as those who have no hope. About those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as indeed the rest of mankind do who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died, we believe that, say amen. Amen. And that he rose from the dead. So also God will bring with him those who have fallen, what? Asleep. I love that. The Bible does not describe the believer as being dead. The Bible describes the believer as simply being what? At rest, asleep. Why? Because you don't need that broken down, beat up body anymore. 
That is not something that is necessary. It's not something that we need to worry about. That body is simply just waiting for something to happen. But the Bible says that we, at that moment, are with, present with the Lord. Think about that for a moment. All these people that have gone before us are waiting for their body. But yet they're present with the Lord. There are things we don't understand. Y'all agree with that? But I'm okay with that because if I could understand everything about God, I wouldn't want to follow him. Because I'm not the brightest person in the world. And don't nobody say amen to that because I will come after you. (laughs) I know how y'all are. I know, Frankie. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, also God will bring with those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by the word of the Lord. Folks, he is doubling down on what he's saying. He has just brought in God. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep. Let me tell you all something. There are a lot of people who have a head start on the rest of us. Now, If you've been to one of these services of mine, you know what I share next. I want to be at a graveside service when Jesus comes back. Do you know how awesome that would be? Right? You're sitting there preaching, and the person in the casket is a believer. And suddenly, the sky opens up. And Jesus steps out in the cloud, and the trumpet blows, and the dead in Christ will what? Rise first. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take me to die seeing that at that moment. Can you you imagine the shock, right? That ground and casket, all of a sudden, everything around you that those believers are just going to open up. It's going to be an amazing moment. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I'm telling you, folks, my great-grandma that I called Granny, she was four foot ten. It won't be that hard for God to bring her up, right? There wasn't a whole lot of her. She was just a little bitty thing. But she used to always tell us, she said, I'm telling you, Get your heart right with God because it's not going to be much longer. Look at the wickedness of this world. She lived to be 99. She was three months shy of 100. And she loved the Lord with all her heart, all her soul, all her mind. Some of you didn't know Miss Betty Zorn. What a heart that woman had for the Lord. You didn't know Roger Binion. You didn't know Miss Rosemary Binion. Those are some of the greats of this church. Brother Howard, I'm telling you, I love, that, love those people I'm talking about. And, and, and they long for that day. And one day that ground's going to open up and all those folks are coming up. And then it says this. The dead in Christ will rise first because they got a head start. Then we who are alive. Now listen, he's not talking about everybody in this room. Listen to me. He's not talking about everybody. He's talking about the believer, those who have put their faith in Christ. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Once that moment happens, I will never be separated. And he says, therefore, comfort one another with what? These words. You don't see me get really excited about a lot of Sermons that I preach. But man, when we're talking about the end and I'm gone, I get excited about that. Because Revelation 21 tells us there's no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more death, no more crying. For the former things have what? Passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Isn't that good? If you're here today and you say, you know, 
I want to be part of that resurrection thing. Let me tell you how that happens. It happens by you understanding first and foremost that it is impossible to please God without faith. We must trust that Jesus was virgin born, that he lived a perfect sinless life, that he went to the cross that belonged to me and that they killed him on that cross. No, he gave his life freely for me. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. He only needed it for how long? Two and a half days. And then he ascended 40 days later to the Father. And he is waiting to come and get his bride, the church. Folks, if you believe in that today, if you put your faith in that today, then you walk that aisle and say for the first time, I'm ready to surrender my life to Christ. Folks, that is salvation trusting, believing in the work of Jesus. Father, this morning we confess to you our great need of you. How desperate we are, Father, to have you in our life. There are some in this room who have never experienced salvation. They've never really understood what it was to be saved. They prayed a prayer one time, Nothing happened. They just simply said these little words that some preacher said, and they repeated them. But they didn't understand that faith, faith in who Jesus is is what saves us. Father, today, may they surrender to you. We pray these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Let's stand together.